Please be advised that this recorded webinar has been edited from its original format, which may have included a product demo. To set up a live demo or to request more information, please complete the form to the right. Or if you are currently not on CSC Global, there is a link to the website in the description of this video. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, ICANN 65 Insights from Marrakesh. My name is Annie Tribaletti, and I will be your moderator. Joining us today is Gretchen Olive. Gretchen is the Director of Policy and Global Domain Name Services for CSC. For nearly two decades, Gretchen has helped Global 2000 companies devise global domain name, trademark, and online brand protection strategies, and is a leading authority on the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, new GTLD program. And with that, let's welcome Gretchen. Thank you, Annie. Well, as usual, we have a full agenda, so we're not going to um, delay. Um, as usual, we'll do a quick ICANN overview. I do see a few new names, which always is exciting to see. Um, so we want to make sure everybody understands kind of who is who ICANN is and um, how they're structured and how things kind of um, flow through that structure. Then we'll jump right into all the key policy updates. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the timing of round two of the new GTLD program and also hopefully have enough time to talk about a few other um, kind of uh, announcements and happenings at the ICANN 65 meeting. So, first of all, ICANN, um, that's Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Um, as we, we often uh, remind everybody, this is a consensus policy organization. And so, you know, con consensus is one of those things that is, uh, it's hard fought. Um, but the organization is made up largely of volunteers. Um, there are some paid staff at uh, there are paid staff at ICANN, but a lot of the folks that are in the boxes below the kind of the board of directors, these people um, are volunteers. Some come from organizations that obviously have a stake in um, internet governance, um, but the blue boxes are supporting organizations. The gray boxes are advisory committees. Um, really, the, the two groups that we predominantly talk about in the ICANN webinar, webinar series is the GNSO, which is the Generic um, Name Supporting Organization. And that's where you'll see you know, anything from business users, intellectual property holders, to registries and registrars. Um, and then we also often talk about the Governmental Advisory Committee, or the GAC. And you'll see them in the, kind of the dark gray box all the way on the right-hand side. Um, so all these groups kind of work to um, develop, um, the blue boxes kind of work to develop policy from a bottom-up um, process. It's a multi-stakeholder model. And as those policies kind of bubble up through these different um, supporting organizations, then they are um, reviewed and uh, approved by um, the board of directors of ICANN. So it's, um, it's a somewhat um, you know, complicated structure, but when we often refer to the ICANN community, this is the group we're talking about. So um, the ICANN, ICANN meetings, Public meetings happen three times a year, and um, that we're now um, in the June, we're talking about the June meeting that happens each year, and this is what they call the policy forum. This is really it's a it's a shorter format, but it's really kind of focused on doing policy work. There's not a lot of the pomp and circumstance and sort of additional um, sessions about you know what I can has accomplished, etc. This is more just the working groups and the different. Um, policy um, issues being discussed across the community. So it's always, um, I have to say, probably my favorite um, format of the year. So um, let's jump into the key policy updates. We're first going to talk about um, the expedited policy development process, or the EPDP, um, phase one and two. As many of you who have attended these sessions before know, there is no limit to the number of acronyms that ICANN has. And so, you know, it's, uh, I try to spell them out so that everybody knows um, what exactly we're talking about. So when you see EPDP um, reference, that's the Expedited Policy Development Process. And this is the first time the EPDP has been used by ICANN, which is something um, kind of remarkable when I think about it. Um, you know, I've started kind of being an ICANN participant back in uh, 2000, and, you know, since then, so, you know, it's been almost 20 years, um, since then they've never used this EPDP um, process. So this is something that was uh, necessary to invoke as a result of 
um, the GDPR, another acronym, but not an ICANN acronym, <laughs> the GDPR is a General Data Protection um, Regulation. So this was a regulation that replaced um, the Data Protection Directive um, in, in uh, Europe, and basically it is really, um, its intent was really to harmonize all the data privacy rules in Europe. Um, when the directive happened back um, in, in the mid-90s, what happened after that is each country then went and passed national laws. And so while similar, there was a lot of differences. And so it was often difficult to kind of reconcile the different data privacy laws and kind of um, rules of the road, if you will, um, in dealing with personal data. Um, in Europe. So the, the GDPR really aims at trying to harmonize that, put a nice big umbrella over it. And then the good thing about um, a regulation um, is that there's no national laws that don't then need to go get um, promulgated. So that's really good news. As most um, everybody knows at this point, because we've all been living through this first year of GDPR, um, it did um, become enforceable in May of uh, 2018. And one of the one of the one of the reasons or the reason that we talk about the GDPR in the context of ICANN is it really directly conflicts with ICANN's um, legacy who is policy. So you know one of the things that you know I think both a blessing and a curse sometimes it depends on what your perspective is um, is the who is 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 a, is public it's required. Um, by all the GTLD regist registrars um, and registries to publish that who is and make it available. Um, so that, you know, that's been something that people have come to rely on. And it could be anyone from, you know, IP rights holders to people who do security research to law enforcement. Um, you name it, there's lots of different groups and people who rely on who is um, to be a data point, perhaps, you know, maybe not the data point, but a data point in trying to piece together a puzzle, identify an infringer, identify a fraudster, um, see some kind of pattern um, in terms of who might be behind some, um, some action uh, in, on the Internet. So when the GDPR went into effect, it took a little while uh, before it, when it was promulgated, which was back in um, 2016, there was kind of a two-year ramp-up period. And it took some time in that two-year ramp-up period, I think, for the ICANN community to really recognize that, oh, no, ICANN's who is policy, which is in the contracts of all the registrars and registries, is in direct conflict with GDPR. The GDPR really... Um, you know, work to protect that personal data. And personal data is pretty broadly defined under the GDPR. And so, you know, so everything, you know, I think obviously a name or an email address, you can say, okay, I understand how that's personal data. But sometimes even a fax number or a, a title, um, things like that can be considered personal data under GDPR. So it was a pretty broad definition. And so um, if it took until, you know, into 2017, into really 2018, for the ICANN community to realize um, this was going to be a problem. To that point, somehow, some way, ICANN um, continued to navigate the different conflicts with national law, but there wasn't this, like, kind of overarching law, like the, like the, the GDPR, where it was going to be a problem across basically every country. In, in Europe, so um, this real, you know, this process was was challenging. There were a lot of um, a lot of you know, kind of, uh, I would say, a lot of time was spent trying to really understand what the GDPR um, was. Uh, not everybody in the ICANN community are aware. So, you know, this is, um, you know, a lot of them are technologists or you know, it's just everyday internet users. And so, you know, it took a while for the community to really get their arms around what the GDPR was, what it wasn't, what what was permitted under that. And there was some ambiguity there that also, um, you know, needed some further discussion with, with regulators. So by the time this was uh, getting to the point where it actually was going to be enforceable in May of 2018, the clock was running out. And there wasn't enough time to really create a whole new ICANN consensus who is policy. So there was something called the temporary specification that was put in place 
that provided a waiver um, really to registries and registrars in terms of publication of personal data in who is, and it also then uh, caused ICANN to trigger this um, expedited policy development process for the first time in its history. And you know, a policy development process in ICANN can sometimes take two to four years. I mean, that's one of the big criticisms of, of ICANN is that in many ways people feel like it moves at a glacial pace. You know, technology is so fast, the internet is so dynamic, but you know, ICANN is something that kind of lumbers along. And I think, you know, having had the perspective of kind of being a, being an observer and, and a participant um, for almost 20 years, I can say it has improved. It has, um, you know, there have been some efficiencies gained. But as I mentioned at, at the top of the webinar, is that consensus is really hard to achieve. And being a kind of bottom-up consensus policy, multi-stakeholder model, you know, a lot of divergent opinions and perspectives at the table on any one issue. And so it takes some time to get through a policy development process. Now, with the EPDP, it's actually mandated that um, the PDP be completed within a, a year. And in all my time at ICANN, I've never seen a PDP go a year. Uh, even what would appear to be the simplest issue, um, you know, people go, oh, this should be a slam dunk. It, it takes way more than a year. So this was a tall order. Um, but the good news is, is that, um, you know, at the end of the day, the it actually start, it actually worked, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, that temporary specification that ICANN had to put in place, as I mentioned, really um, changed, made, made significant redactions to the who is contact data, sometimes referred to as the social data within the who is. So if you ever look at a who is record, you'll see there's lots of information there about the domain, like when it was registered, when it will expire, what its DNS is, who the registrar is, all that type of stuff. That's sort of domain related data. But then you have what's called the social data or the contact data, which is you know your registrar, admin, technical billing, and their kind of name, address, phone number, email, and that's where you get into trouble with personal data. So that significant redaction um, really, you know, I think while we talked about it for probably a year leading up to the enforcement of uh, the beginning of the enforcement of the GDPR, um, I think it's really been over the last, you know, eight or nine months that people are like, wow, this has had a greater impact on sort of um, our overall day-to-day, -day, our overall operations, our overall processes, um, particularly in um, the security and fraud investigation area. The, the who is is a very significant component to that research and sort of that kind of backtracking, and it's causing um, a lot of concern that that is missing and, you know, trying to um, figure out how do legitimate um, and a legitimate third parties or parties with legitimate third uh, with legitimate interests get access to that data if, if that's at all possible. So we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But um, the you know the the this who is thing is that something that's been debated. Just who is policy overall? Even though there's been consensus policy in place, I can remember my very first ICANN meeting. You know, sitting in a room with about you know, total at the meeting, maybe 150 people, and, you know, debating who is policy. Um, it's always been a very controversial um, thing, you know, to, to a lot of registrars, that's their customer list. To researchers, that's data. To um, privacy advocates, that's too much information. You know, you can see it's just, you know, everybody comes at it with a different perspective. And so it has been a uh, really hotly contested issue that's never really gotten resolution. So, you know, in, in kind of trying to assess how quickly we could get through a policy development process, um, I think it was very wise at the beginning to kind of break this into two phases. And so the EPDP team um, kind of cr uh, created phase one and phase two. Phase one was really about the collection and handling of who is contact data and requests for who is data. Um, and that was the part that was subject to the one-year deadline to come up with 
kind of recommendations or policy uh, prescriptions around that aspect of it. Then sort of the access to who is data by registrars, registries, ICANN, and other third parties was really seen more as implementation and not as much policy. Um, while there'll be some policies that will be needed to either be um, existing policies that may need to be changed or updated or new policies created to support the implementation, phase two really was viewed as sort of the implementation component of the EPDP and therefore came outside, could be done outside that initial one year um, kind of time limit. So, um, you know, on the good news front, um, the EP EPDP phase one team did issue a final report in February of 2019, actually, in advance, in, you know, before the May deadline, which was fantastic. Um, that group, you know, really did amazing work. They were meeting 30 hours a week um, uh, for, you know, months to try to get to that point. And there were some big roadblocks. And in fact, ICANN needed to bring in mediators um, to help the team get through some of those discussions and debates because as in the past, people, you know, had their position, they dug their heels in and they weren't budging. But um, ultimately they were able to get to a, a final report which had 29 recommendations. Um, the public comment period ran through mid-April and then ICANN board actually adopted 27 of the 29 recommendations without change in mid-May of this year. Um, the two recommendations that didn't get um, adopted without change was recommendation one around purpose and um, recommendation 12, which was around the deletion of the organization field and the who is. So there'll be more about that as we, uh, as we move through this process. Um, so um, with that phase one kind of policy development under our belt, um, what happens in the ICANN world is once sort of the policy gets approved by the board, then an implementation review team gets, us, um, gets created. And in this case, both an implementation planning team and an implementation re uh, review team have been formed. So let me explain what the difference is between those two. The implementation planning team is actually made up of ICANN staff. They're the folks who are really going to be, you know, facilitating how this all get, how these recommendations actually get implemented, the processes, the templates, the communications, all that stuff that needs to happen within um, the ICANN world to get this policy out um, and implemented across the ecosystem. The implementation review team is made up of people in the com from the community. Um, and they're there, they, they need to have a certain back, you know, a, a solid background in, this issue, in these issues. And they're there to support the implementation planning team and really serve as, you know, help to clarify the experiences in the community. Um, you know, policy, the, the recommendations are just that. They're not written in policy language. That's part of what ICANN will do is we'll kind of write the policy, the actual policy. And, the implementation review team will really help kind of shape that so that it is in the language and in the kind of um, operational uh, workflow of how the ecosystem actually works. You know, a lot of times um, something may look good from a, you know, written policy, but that's not how the domain system works. It's not how registrars and registries interact. It's not, you know, you have to kind of have an operational knowledge of how everything Happen. So these two teams will be working together to achieve the implementation of this new basically registration um, data consensus policy. So there's a lot of um, hard work ahead. Um, the team is really in, um, these two teams are really in the process of um, doing what's kind of, uh, kind of called the requirements analysis. But before they jumped into that, um, you'll see this kind of, they, they were calling this the rainbow um, diagram, which was kind of interesting, but um, this this uh, kind of timeline diagram kind of shows you how this is um, projected to map out in terms of timeline. So, you know, the board adopted the rec the 27 of the 29 recommendations as is, and then two would change. Um, there, the um, 
the team then had to issue an interim policy because what happened at the close of that year from the um, from when the temporary specification was issued, that temporary spe specification was also good for just one year. So if they hadn't gotten to the finish line in time, there would have been a little bit of a crisis. Um, but we didn't have to face that, which is outstanding. Um, what happened though is uh, the this the IPT and IRT issued um, this interim policy that basically said, all right, for the most part, what, to, what was in the temporary specification is going to continue while we work through the implementation of um, the recommendations. And so um, the interim policy was issued um, in, in late May, and now we're in the kind of uh, a really kind of heads down working phase. Of you know trying to do implementation planning, trying to gather public. Well, there'll be a public comment phase of this, and then sort of a finalization of the actual policy language. Um, so that's all. You know, everybody's kind of hoping that that gets done. Um, really, by you know, you know, by the next ICAN meeting, a little bit afterwards. So that is in um, October, November. So there's a lot of work <laughs> to do between now and then. And then um, it'll be on to kind of policy implementation, and the hope is to be completed with that by um, the end of February of next year, where that will be in full effect. So it's very aggressive, it's very optimistic. I am going to say I am more optimistic than I have been in the past. I think these teams have shown that um, with the focus that they've put on it and the energy and time that they've um, dedicated to everything, that it is possible. Um, but like everything in the ICANN world, there's always a chance for delay. I don't think it's going to be years, it may be months. So we'll we'll continue to watch this uh, space, but um, certainly a lot of um, heavy lifting to come. Now, one of the things to just also, I think, keep in the back of your mind is this is kind of going on and you know we'll continue to update you on this is that there is a recognition that um, this these pol this new policy this new you know registration data consensus policy is going to have kind of a ripple effect that there are other consensus policies within the ICANN world that you know they all kind of link to each other it's a it's a little bit of a fabric, you know, it's one of those things where um, I think when you're new to the, the ICANN policy space, it's one of the most confusing things is that there's no place where you just kind of go read a policy document and you go, oh, great. No, you have to kind of read it and then you got to read alongside another one and then that takes you to another one and then that takes you to another one. And then you got to kind of think about them all together. Um, it, it is a little bit of a, you know, kind of a tapestry. Um, but these are some of the policies just sort of at first blush um, that are thought, that will, are expected to be affected in some way. And so what that will likely trigger is some additional policy work on these other policies. Um, now that additional policy work won't hold up completing this work, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is there's gonna be a little bit of a, a domino effect here is that once this new registration data um, consensus policy gets into place, there's going to kind of be some additional housekeeping that's going to need to be done. And so the, IK, the volunteers within the ICANN community are going to, you know, there's going to be a big strain basically um, to try to get a lot of this work done because um, it is one of those things where there's only so many, so much bandwidth, right? There's only so much air um, in the room for everybody to focus and to kind of contribute, and so it will be, um, I think we'll be talking about this long after, you know, a year from now, I guess is the point uh, I'm going to uh, make here. So um, more to come on that. In addition to ICANN consensus policies that will be impacted, there are also ICANN procedures that will likely be impacted. And so uh, it's a smaller list, which is good. Some of the work is already actually being contemplated as part of ongoing um, PDPs, so that's good news, but there will be some changes to processes that the, the community has really become 
um, used to, reliant on. So again, um, watch the space for, for more updates on that. But um, this is a major this is a major change, and I think that's one of the reasons why the who is policy has always been um, one of those things that everybody's afraid to pull the thread on because once you do, it just sort of um, goes on from there. So, but it's it's high time that this happens. Um, I, uh, I, you know, it, it's terrible that it's had to have been a fire drill, but I think I'm hopeful that um, when we get to the end of this process that we're actually going to have um, a who is policy that serves the best interests of um, the community. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that um, ends. Let's talk a little bit about EPDP phase two, since phase one seems to be chugging along. Um, phase two officially began in May um, after the after the ICANN uh, board adopted the 27 of the 29 recommendations. Um, the the team the phase two team is made up of some people from phase one. There are some newbies, including the chair. Um, I think this team is still trying to find their footing. Um, during this ICANN meeting, some of their working, you know, the working meetings that I attended, uh, it's still a lot of kind of circular conversation going on and um, definitely some, uh, I would say, infighting or battling that's um, going on that we saw in the PDP phase one. There's a recognition that they are too going to need mediators to kind of get through some of this stuff. I know it sounds really harsh. It's harsh. It's almost like, um, you know, can't everybody just get along? But, you know, these are, again, people come from very different perspectives, very different um, areas of the ecosystem, and they are pretty hardened in their position. So I, it does, I think, take professionals to kind of get them to inch closer together. Um, so the, the team will be working on answering some charter questions and drafting policy recommendations based on um, a system for standardized access and disclosure. So what do I, what do I mean by that? So um, the vision right now is that there's actually what's called a unified access model. And so that would be where there would be one central place for GTLDs. Um, Third parties would bring legitimate requests for um, for who is information, for additional who is information. Um, the who is as we've known it in the past will no longer exist. Um, there will be, however, there, the vision is, is that there will be some opportunity to get to greater information than what exists today, which is <clears throat> largely domain data and um, virtually no contact data uh, unless a company voluntarily wants to publish it. Um, and some brand owners do because it's the way they kind of um, defend their trademark rights. But um, for the most part, uh, a lot of the who is is dark. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's there, there needs to be a mechanism to do for legitimate purposes to get to that additional information. Right now, it's a very haphazard, very kind of registrar, uh, registrar by registrar, registry by registry process. It's not working. Um, people are very frustrated. Um, some, um, you know, some registries and registrars have very defined processes. Some, it seems like any request goes into a black hole. There's no um, governance over those processes. There's no oversight over those processes. There's no um, SLAs. And it is extremely frustrating for, for people who are trying to do everything from um, enforce their IP rights to find fraudsters um, on, on the internet um, or you know track down uh, bad actors. So the vision right now is for this unified access model. ICANN has kind of raised their hand and said, we're willing to be that central point where those requests come and then we'll have um, sort of a technical solution potentially that can help route it through the system to get the who is data so, you know from the the registrar or the um, registry whichever is appropriate depending on the TLD and then um, get that back to the requester um, there is an open question 
as to whether or not the DPAs in Europe are comfortable with that. Um, the DPAs are the data protection, um, you know, agencies or officers, um, and for each country. And there's, you know, an ongoing dialogue between ICANN um, executive team, partic particularly um, Gordon Marbury, who's the, the president and CEO of ICANN, and the DPAs to understand if that is something they see as a proper way to um, kind of deal with these requests um, under the G uh, GDPR. So that's a very key question. <laughs> if the DPAs come back, uh, you know, the European Commission come back and say, mm, no, we don't think that's right, that's just kind of, um, you know, not in alignment with GDPR principles, um, I think that's going to be a major um, setback. But I think right now things are looking good. Um, so we'll continue to watch that. Um, so, you know, they're going to continue to work on trying to figure out what's the best um, system for this standardized access and disclosure. So, um, You've seen this diagram if you've been on this webinar series before. This is a very ugly diagram. Um, it is one that um, I think, though, kind of gets everything on one page. Um, it's something that I can't put together, and I think it's really kind of hard to describe all this, but it really describes sort of the changes in who is as well as how I can could protect, uh, per, um, perhaps act as that sort of, you know, um, central point to make these requests. So we'll, um, you know, continue to watch and see if this is the the mechanism and the process and sort of structure that we wind up using. Um, the EPDP, EPDP phase that should be phase two, not phase three, um, which is that standardized system for who is access disclosure. Um, this is the projected timeline right now, and there's a lot of angst around the timing of this for very obvious reasons. Um, right now, the hope is that somewhere in Q1, um, there would be the development of the final report. Uh, I do think this work group is, again, having challenges, and so unless those kind of mediators get in there and really get the team moving, um, and kind of all rowing in, this, in the same direction to um, come up with recommendations. I think that could be at risk. I um, was talking to one of our um, clients the other day, and I think um, the way I would put it at this point is the next couple of months are really critical. If they don't overcome some of their baseline issues and ability to kind of not talk in circles, but actually m each meeting take a step forward, um, if that doesn't happen in the next couple of months, then I think that Q1 date is in serious jeopardy. There is not a hard requirement that they meet this deadline. Unlike the phase one team had that hard deadline of a year, this team doesn't have a hard, you know, kind of regulatory deadline. However, the governmental advisory committee, which is, you know, um, I, I pointed out in that one of the first diagram, um, kind of organizational diagram at the top of the webinar, that's the group made up of um, ministers or, you know, um, representatives of ministries from different um, governments across the globe. Um, I think it's close to 200 at this point. Um, they kind of come to ICANN meetings and participate in ICANN on behalf of their governments to provide advice to the ICANN board and, to the, uh, and, and it's evolved into a kind of guidance to the ICANN community to say, hey, um, you know, the direction you're going in is kind of against public policy um, considerations that we would have as a government in terms of uh, protecting our, our residents. And so, a lot of the uh, many in the governmental advisory committee have been very vocal. It started the last meeting, and it was really loud and clear this meeting that there is a urgency to get this figured out. That uh, especially for you know security reasons. Um, the who is, access to who is, is needed, and ICANN needs to get this job done. So there's a lot of pressure, but not a hard um, kind of uh, regulatory deadline. So 
um, this will be a timeline that everybody will be watching very closely. So that's all the EPDP fund, um, which uh, is something that uh, I know has um, been on a lot of people's minds. But let's um, now turn to um, another PDP that's um, going on simultaneous, and that's the Rights Protection Mechanism, or RPM's PDP. Um, this PDP came about um, on the back of um, the new TTLD program, round one. So as everybody will recall, back in 2012, ICANN opened up um, a window of application um, for people to come forward and apply for new GTLDs. There were 1,409 unique strings that were applied for. Uh, I believe it was like 1,920 applications overall. It far surpassed what ICANN expected. Um, the process, the, the, uh, the first round, kind of the whole evaluation of applications and kind of moving um, TLDs to launch have, has had a very bumpy ride. And so at the close of sort of that, you know, the, the, the I would say the evaluation, as the evaluation of applications started to um, really tail off, um, there was a real recognition and something I can promise the GAC, in fact, the Governmental Advisory Committee, a real need to evaluate certain components of the program. And one of it was the rights protection mechanism. Everybody wanted to make sure, did we get it right? Were some of these new rights protection mechanisms that were put in place for um, the first round, were they the right ones? Um, did they work? Did they not work? Do they need to be improved? So um, the RPM has been <laughs> going on for quite some time. Um, the PDP is being conducted in two phases. Um, as I mentioned before, it, it covers all rights protection mechanisms which were applicable to the first round or the new GTLD round that happened in 2012. Um, and you can see here the different components of it. So looking at the trademark post-delegation dispute resolution procedure, that's the TMP, DDRP, yes, that is a long acronym. Um, the Trademark Clearinghouse, the TMCH, um, Sunrise and Trademark Claim Services, as well as the Uniform Rapid Suspension um, Dispute Resolution Procedure. So um, phase two is focusing more on reviewing the Uniform Dispute Resolution uh, Policy, which is the UDRP, which is something that was a rights protection mechanism in this first round of new GTLDs, but actually has existed since 1999 and has been in place for GTLDs. So, um, it, it's an existing rights protection mechanism that was, um, you know, carried over into the new TTLD program, and so they want to do an evaluation, uh, review, I should say, of, of the effectiveness of the UDRP and the new GTLDs as well. So um, where are they? They um, have completed the preliminary review of um, three of the components. Um, right now they have two sub-teams that have been um, working hard at reviewing the Sunrise um, and Trademark Claims Services. Um, these two sub-teams, you know, one is focused on the, the Sunrise um, component of, of the launch, and the other um, sub-team is, is focused on the Trademark Claims process. And you know, they've had, they have some um, recommendations they've kind of arrived at as a team, so basically um, and it appears to be, uh, you know, consensus-driven. Um, that there'll be likely no, you know, the recommendation is that there be no change to the 30-day start date and 60-day end date sunrises. So for those of you who've participated in any of the new GTLD launches, um, you'll know some of them, um, you know, they, they announced um, the launch and it's, it's kind of first come, first serve, or um, that's the start date one. Or it's a 60-day end date where basically they take all the applications for 60 days and then at the end um, award the, the, the Sunrise names that are um, and then deal with any contentions. So, you know, they, they think those two options should remain. Um, they also um, recommend that Sunrise should continue to only allow registrations of domain strings that exactly match trademarks and not, you know, allowing variations or trademark cloth term, things like that that Sunrise should truly be for those exactly matching strings. Um, some things that they're recommending, um, you know, kind of need more work, if you will, is that uh, they're 
appear, you know, there's a, a, a feeling, and I, I, I strongly believe that there was um, some registries out there, some of the new GTLD registries that um, circumvented, let's just say that, circumvented the uh, Sunrise process or Sunrise RPMs in how they um, handled certain aspects of, of the rollout of the TLD. Um, you know, some of the reserves and premium names, the way they were kind of withheld and then released post sunrise period. Um, you know, some of those you know, some of those um, reserved and premium names matched trademarks, and there was no, in, in some cases, there was no kind of sunrise for um, the, that subsequent release. So that's an example of where I think there was some circumvention of the sunrise. RPMs and the protections for trademark holders. So these are things that um, need to be addressed, um, need to be tightened up um, as it relates to Sunrise. And then on the trademark claims um, recommendations, um, I think there, there's definitely a, a consensus that the claim notice needs to be improved. Um, it needs to be available in multiple languages. English is not the language spoken by everybody. Um, it needs to be clear. There needs to be um, kind of less legalese and more kind of understandable language for all with a little bit more specificity. So, um, however, they also feel that, you know, the trademark claims process is a good one and it should continue to apply all, to all types, you know, whether it be open, closed, geo, community, all types of TLDs and also continue to be active for 90 days. So. Um, we should see that um, those recommendations as part of the overall RPM PDP team's initial report. Um, they had hoped to have that for end of June. Then as this meeting kind of happened, they said, well, we're going to need a few more weeks, a couple more meetings. Um, we hope by end of July. So we'll continue to watch when that comes out. Um, and really, the once that comes out, there's you know kind of that's an initial report. There's public comment, then there's a final report, um, and then there's um, it will go to the ICANN board, and then there'll need to be implementation. So the policy development process is um, the hope is is that that will be completed by April 2020. Um, I, you know, I think if they can get this report out in July, that that can happen. I think as it, if it slips further, you might see that um, April date slip. Um, and then phase two, which is the UDRP review component of this, that will start right off the back of um, completion of the phase one PDP. So um, no shortage of work, lots to do, um, but this is starting to wind down. It's been definitely a long, long process. Um, Another PDP, it seems like there's no shortage of them. <laughs> um, but all these are running subsequently, you know, sorry, concurrently, and it's um, definitely a big challenge to, you know, get everybody's attention and um, kind of brains on these things. But the next one is uh, also related to the first round of new GTLDs. And again, you know, it was something that was promised would happen is, okay, let's look at that, um, all the procedures that go into um, evaluating and launching TLDs, and so that, those were things that were in the applicant guidebook of the new GTLD program. Um, so that is what the subsequent procedures PDP is looking at. Um, there are some general overarching issues, you know, um, as the first round of the program kind of um, evolved, uh, there really wasn't a recognition in the first round and in the applicant guidebook of um, there were two types of TLDs in, in, in that round. One was open and one was community. But as many people now know, you know, other kind of categories have evolved and a kind of arisen. You know, we have things like dot brands, we have things like geo TLDs. They're, they all have the sort of different needs and different um, uh, kind of um, communities that, that um, you know, utilize them. So, you know, does the, the next round need to kind of recognize these different types? Um, the second thing is, you know, there needs to be more predictability. There needs to be more community engagement. I think if you were around in 20, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, um, there was this sort of like, 
I would say, slow ramp up of awareness of the program. And I think by the end, it was pretty much at a fever pitch and a lot of people in the, I would say, in the trademark community were aware of it. But globally, I don't think there was global awareness of the program. And I think where the applications come from really kind of speak to that. You see a high concentration in the U.S., followed by EMEA, followed by APAC with very low rates in, you know, emerging countries like Africa, um, you know, the Middle East. Um, you'll, you don't see a whole lot out of um, Latin America. So, you know, there, there needs to be um, better community engagement, better awareness. There also needs to be more predictability. Like I mentioned, there were a lot of bumps. The applications were taken in 2012. The first TLD didn't launch until end of October, beginning of November of 2013. And it really wasn't until 2014, 2015 did we get um, a lot of them launched. So it was a long process. And then um, there's this, this notion that do these TLD applications always need to be taken in rounds with very like kind of defined windows, or should there be an open window and just ongoing ability to apply. I think there's some for that, some against that. I think that, um, I don't think we're there yet. I know we're not there yet. I think that's where I can, I, you know, that is where I can is trying to drive to and many people in, in the community. But um, I definitely see round two being a defined window. I, I don't think it's going to be an open period. But nonetheless, this subsequent procedures PDP is looking at that. And they have different work tracks that they kind of divided the work into. And so you can see them here. There's five work tracks um, that kind of divide up that work. Now, um, they've been working hard, again, for a long time, just like the, the, the rights protection mechanisms, um, PDP. Um, and they are, um, you know, trying to wind things up. I will tell you, Work Track 5, which is the uh, issues around geographical names, it's an issue that is very near and dear to the GAC, it's very sensitive to um, commercialization of country names, country um, two-letter codes, or other kind of geographic designations, rightfully so. Um, there's, a, I think, uh, there's a balance to be found. We're getting closer. <laughs> but I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, but that's really, um, Work Track 5 is, um, is definitely lagging behind, but again, trying to catch up. They're really working to complete their final report by the end of 2019. Um, again, I think that's potentially possible, but um, it, it's gonna take a quick kind of burst of energy and uh, effort, I think, to get that over the, the finish line. So um, we'll continue to watch for that. I definitely think that um, we are likely to see some um, some need for um, adjustments to the applicant um, guidebook. So uh, stay tuned on that one. So related to these last two PDPs, the ones on RPM and subsequent procedures, um, you know, there's a lot of question around. Well, when will round two be? There's pressure within the community about getting to round two. There's some people who um, regretted not applying in round one. Um, there's others who have kind of changed their view of the program. There's still a fair number of people saying, you know, the TLD program was not a success. There hasn't been high utilization. There hasn't been this, um, you know, uh, kind of, I think the volume of registrations that many people were predicting. Um, but I also think success is defined in different ways than just how many domain names you sell. And especially when it comes to, you know, ones like brands and geos, I think some of it is about sort of an identity. And um, so anyway, there's a significant pro uh, pressure to get to round two. Um, I would say not everybody shares that desire, but there is um, a fair amount of people who do want to get there. Um, I can is definitely trying to build some momentum towards that. Um, right before the ICANN 65, they published a discussion paper entitled ICANN Org's Readiness to Support Future Rounds of New GTLDs. 
their explanation for doing this is like, look, there's a lot of policy stuff that you know needs to be done and has been underway for a long time, but there's also a lot of stuff that I can, the organization needs to do, systems, people, processes that they need to put in place to be ready when all the policy work is done. And you know they're trying to get some budget and some um, kind of momentum going where they could put a flag in the sand and say we're going to do it by this date. Um, you know, there's also, quite honestly, I'm, I can't the nonprofit organization. They've grown in size. Their staff is, um, has, has definitely um, grown. There are some, I think, budgetary concerns around being able to keep all those people who now have kind of gained experience in this program. And so I think the longer and longer and longer that they wait to get to round two, the fear is they'll lose some of that expertise, they'll lose some of that staff, whether it be through attrition or potentially just not being able to continue to afford um, afford them. Um, because again, the registration volumes have not been huge and, and I can um, you know, generate revenue through domain registration. So a portion of every domain name registration, about 20 cents goes on every domain name to ICANN and that goes to their budget. So um, there's definitely this feeling that we need to get on with it within ICANN. Um, there are a lot of consultants out there and some, I would say, boutique um, you know, registries and registrars that they need round two to come fast to survive. Um, they need that revenue infu uh, infusion, and so they are banging the drum hard. Um, so you'll probably hear a lot in, of, you know, ICANN's getting ready, it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna happen. I've heard some people predict it will be the end of 2020. Um, I'm going to tell you my guess is no. Um, it's likely going to be uh, closer to 2020. 2022, hard to say. Um, so with that being said, I, I wouldn't worry about writing any checks this year, um, but certainly uh, we'll, we'll keep you apprised. Um, just a few other things, I, I probably won't go much into each, but um, they'll definitely be in the deck that you can um, download. Some other things that you should be aware of as a, in terms of meeting updates. Um, you know, there's been, uh, since 2016, there was a privacy proxy provider accreditation policy that was approved by the ICANN board. Um, it's been an issue in the community for a really long time, privacy and proxy. Um, there's been a lack of kind of oversight and control of privacy and proxy providers. Um, so, you know, policy was, um, a PDP happened, policy was adopted, IRT was formed in 2016. They've been kind of chugging along. But now with all this GDPR stuff and the EPDP stuff that happened afterwards, um, they have now officially put that on hold. So it's, uh, it's, Many people are disappointed. Uh, I, I can understand the challenges of these issues and how they collide, um, but you know we have to figure out how to get to the end of this process. Um, dot Amazon. Um, I think the last time we were together for this webinar series, um, I told you Amazon got the green light, or you know we're close to getting the green light. Well, they did get the green light, but now it's back on yellow. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to watch that. I think a lot of people are um, interested in what happens there given um, Amazon's kind of um, profile on the internet and it's, um, it, the weight that it could carry if they actively use that TLD. So we'll continue to watch. Um, Columbia has kind of stepped forward and filed a motion for reconsideration of ICANN's decision to um, approve the application. Um, the Latin American community that's in that Amazon region is very unhappy with ICANN right now. And uh, the GAC communique, which is always their sort of um, summary of the meeting and the issues that they want ICANN to further consider. Um, they, the three kind of concerns that they highlighted or really emphasized in their communique was around two letter country codes and second level domains. It continues to be a concern for them. ICANN's approval of the Amazon application, and then the timing for EPDP phase two completion. Again, they're very concerned for security reasons about the lack of access to who is. 